Good morning, everybody. Hope you had a fabulous weekend. We are now into August, the last stretch, the home stretch of summer. So hopefully you are out there enjoying it with your family, friends, and uh, making good uh, uh, with it. So um, as usual, if you've got questions, concerns, things going well, things going poorly, uh, please let me know. We've had uh, 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 just a recent spat of events that have gone extremely well, and we're going to talk about that, I believe, next week. So that's uh, great news rolling into the, uh, the fall uh, marketing season. So guys, you, if you, you, the two best months of the remaining year are September, October. And remember, you need, to, uh, you, have, you need 30 days to 35 days to get that up and running. So if you're thinking about doing, and I hope you are thinking about doing some marketing in September and October, now is the time to be planning that. So if you have any questions on that, just shoot Missy an email. She's uh, an expert at helping you guys do that. So um, if you were thinking about doing marketing, and the remainder of this year, you got to be doing it in September, October. That means you're on a time clock right now. You got about two weeks max to, to get your act together to get something scheduled for September. So uh, please be doing that. So with that said, and, and again, we're going to talk a lot more about that next Monday. So that said, though, I want to talk today about AUM versus commission. Uh, I'm going to give you a riddle first. So what I want to talk about today, guys, is cost. What it costs investors to work with us. And why do you think that, that we should be talking about that, guys? And it's going to become very apparent uh, through the next uh, 45 minutes or so why we are. But why do you, I want to see with you guys, why do you think it's so important that we be talking about how clients pay us? What's happened to society in the last 10, 15 years? I'm going to wait to see some answers on this. It's already in their mind, Frank. I would agree with that, absolutely. Come on, guys, why is this so important? Commoditization, Daniel, exactly. Very cost conscious, transparency, leery of fees. So uh, even the wealthy are shopping where now? Even the wealthy are shopping where? Online, absolutely, online. Where else? Yeah, online. They're all, but they're, 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 they're discounts. Uh, at the dollar store, Walmart, Todd, exactly. Even the wealthy are shopping at Target, are shopping at Walmart, are shopping at Sam's Club. People are extremely cost conscious now. And you know, how many people are use their cell phones now or their smartphones to double check on prices immediately? I mean, at, at real time. Everybody wants a good deal. Exactly, Paul. Everybody wants a good deal. So if you're not paying attention to your fees, you're going to get slapped sooner rather than later. So let's talk about fees and how people pay us. So they really have two options, assets under management or a commission. So I'm going to give you a riddle first here. So let's say I have an investor and they have a $500,000 portfolio. And both, they're going to go to two different advisors. And both the advisors say they can average 10% over the next 20 years, an average of 10% over the next 20 years. So both advisors are saying they can do that, not one is saying they can do better. Planner A proposes a total fee of 2%, including his fee and the money manager's fee. So 1% for the money manager and 1% for um, himself. And then Planner B proposes a single one-time commission up front. So you understand that the proposal, proposal, the same rates of return, Planner A proposes a total fee of 2%, including his fee, so the 1% for himself, 1% for the money manager, which is uh, fairly typical in today's world. And then um, Planner B proposes a single one-time commission up front. So here's the riddle. What commission would give the investor an equal amount as advisor A's 2%? So the investor starting out with 500000 Both are saying they can get him 10% over the next 20 years. So what can planner B uh, charge, the, uh, charge the investor? How much can they charge the investor up front and still end up with the same amount of money as planner A? Jerry says 200 k uh, 20 years, Dan. Over 20 years. Over 100K. Whoops, 400K. Whoa. So what could he charge up front? So if it was 400K, it means he would start with a portfolio of 100,000. So I got 15,000 from Barry. So some of you guys are getting fairly close. Advisor B could charge an upfront commission of 153,000. And still come out with the same amount of money, 150,000, and still come out with the same amount of money as a, a, a AUM of two percent. So, 
That's an upfront fee in excess of 30% of the portfolio could be charged without causing any more damage than a 2% all-in fee. So does that mean that uh, AUMs are bad? No. Does that mean that commissions are bad? No. Does it mean AUM is good? No. Does it mean that commissions are good? No. It means, though, that, that a lot of, how, if I ask this question to most advisors, I mean, I can, uh, of the guys out here, I had one go all the way up to, from, uh, the, the guesses were from 50, oh, 150, so 15,000 all the way up to 400,000. So um, we have to be aware of this. And if, if, if you are an asset uh, manager, you better start talking about this up front because if you're not talking about it, guess what? If you're not talking about it, guess what? Does that mean they're not hearing anything about it? It means that uh, out of sight, out of mind, you know, uh, that's hear no evil, see no evil, think no evil, the three monkeys. If you're not talking about it, and even if the competition isn't talking about it, who's talking about it? Yeah, Brian, we need to be full. We talked about that last week. We have to give full disclosure to, to our clients. If we're, if we're moving clients over to us using disclosure, we sure to heck better not be part of the problem. So we better disclose uh, to ourselves. But here's the thing, guys. Yes, the competition is talking about that, but more importantly, who else is talking about that? Friends, neighbors, I'd agree with that. How many of you guys read Money Magazine, Clip, Kiplinger's Magazine, go online to consumer websites? Guess what they're all talking about? Yeah, Paul says commission always sounds worse than uh, fees. So, uh, but you know what? Here's I would totally agree with you. In in in, in the past, um, commission was like a like the third rail. It was like the electric third rail. You didn't want to touch that because clients immediately assumed that if you charge commissions, that you were you were uh, that was the worst way to do it. And this kind of shows you that wow. I mean. How many consumers would guess that it's 150,000? I mean, a lot, you, a lot of you guys got fairly close to it, but how many consumers would assume that $153,000 upfront on a $500,000 portfolio would be better than a two, the annual management fee? Not too many, I think we can uh, assume. But here's the thing. Commissions used to always be thought as bad, but more and more now in the news, in the consumer news, not our news, but in the consumer news, the, the news that uh, people who consume financial products see, Assets fees are becoming more and more of an issue. So now I got another question for you. To which fund company do you direct your client? You got Fund Family ABC with an expense of 10 bips or 10 basis points on bond funds and 20 basis points on the stock fund. Or Fund Family XYZ with an expense ratio of 20 on the bond fund and 10 on the stock fund. So which one would be better to have the higher expense ratio on the bond fund or the higher expense ratio on the stock fund? Which one would be better? The higher on the stock fund or the higher on the bond fund? I'm getting both. But most of you are getting this right. You're correct. The higher, or it doesn't matter in the end, it matters. The correct answer is B, which means what? the higher is on the bond fund. It is best to assign the higher expense ratio to the investment with the lower expected return. This is the flip of what uh, managers say. You usually hear that because stock funds have higher potential returns, the client can handle higher expenses as compared to a vanilla bond fund. Am I right or am I wrong on that, guys? How do, how do uh, money managers validate their fees? How do they validate their fees? Returns, exactly, Casey, returns. I'm going to get you a higher performance. That's why I should be able to charge you a higher fee. But in return, but in actuality, is that a smart or a bad, a dumb thing for a client? If, I mean, most of you answered this right. Most of you did answer that the lower fee, or I mean, sorry, the higher fee should be on the bond fund and not the stock fund. So in reality, <laughs> many managers that are charging high fees for stock funds have got it completely what? Backwards, because the high fee should be, now here's the thing, how many people are going to be able to charge a high fee on a bond fund? Why do they charge, I mean, as, when you look at different uh, money managers, they charge more for the stock manager or st stock management or the bond management of the portfolio? 
Which one? The stock, exactly right, Dan. They charge more on the stock. But in reality, then, they should be charging more on the bond, but why can they not charge more on the bond? Yeah, Peter says, in today's environment, might, one might have a negative return on low uh, yield bonds. And the fact is, is that, uh, and I'd agree, I'd agree, Brahma, it looks bad, but the, the, the real thing is that what? For most bond funds, they're considered, like I said earlier, vanilla. That they're not that difficult, and they're not. You're not. They're not, usually guys aren't trading bonds back and forth. They buy a bond and hold it to maturity, or at least to, uh, mostly to maturity. So, um, and, and Dan, you're right. It's too high a percentage of, of the return. So, in actuality, then, are are uh, are money managers doing a good thing for uh, clients or a bad thing for clients when they charge less on the bond and high higher on the uh, stocks? Yeah, exactly right, Brahma. The bonds are considered commodities. So, do you see how? Um, on the surface, how many clients, how many consumers would realize that on a $500,000 portfolio, you could charge $153,000 up front as compared to a 2% a year fee? How many uh, consumers would realize that it would be better to pay a higher fee on the, the safe fund than on the uh, uh, more uh, expensive fund? Very, very few. I agree with you, Bill. Very, very few. So it's our job to understand these things. Now they looked at the front end loans. Front end loads were the same thing. If you had a front end load, which one is better? It's better to have the front end load higher on what? Stock funds or bond funds? Bond funds. Exactly right, Bravo. Bond funds. It's the same, same. So the higher the rate of return, the more costly a single basis point of additional expense becomes, and this is now becoming a very, very prominently placed in, uh, in all the consumer uh, media for financial products. They're really starting to point out, and it's been around forever, expenses, but it's really starting to become uh, a focal point for many, many uh, consumer uh, media channels. So the funny thing is, though, I hear that it's okay to charge a fee because I'm going to beat the market. So I've talked about this about once a month. Is it possible to beat the market, guys, on a regular basis? I'm getting a lot of no's. Good. Good, because statistically, no, exactly. Statistically, no, you can't. So unfortunately, there's very little. Uh, this is out of the Journal of Financial Planning. So the Journal of Financial Planning is an equity-oriented uh, 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 journal, I mean, a, a very academic type journal. Unfortunately, there is little empirical evidence that money managers can beat the broad stock market index by even 2%. And that's from two different uh, studies. And there were many more studies, but I just pulled the two studies off. But he, I, I love this. Uh, up, who, does anybody know who Upton Sinclair is? We'll see how good, if we have any English majors out there. Upton Sinclair wrote what book? The, very good, Frank. He wrote The Jungle, which was about the, um, uh, what do you call it, the meat industry. So, um, uh, what do you call it? What do you call the meat industry? Somebody, my brain just blew Frank over. says it's meat, the meat industry too. So, yeah. what well, is meat. meat industry? But there's a word for it. What, what do you call the, the meat industry? I can't remember. Um, so, the jungle was about how horrible. Slaughterhouse, thank you, Frank. The slaughterhouse industry. So, and I, I love his quote here. It is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. So what, what do you think the point of that is? It's difficult to get money managers to understand that they shouldn't be charging high fees on stock funds as compared to bond funds when their salary depends upon understanding that. It's difficult for financial advisors to understand many things. They have voluntary blindness, Frank, exactly right. So it's difficult to, for many of the, our competitors to understand these things. The great thing is if we understand them, can we use that? If we understand these things, can we use these this information? And I'll tell you, I agree with Frank's uh, 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 phrase of voluntary blindness. Does our industry, our competitors, do they suffer from a, a, an extreme degree of voluntary blindness? Guys, even though we're required, uh, it's required on any mountain chart of rate of return or any tab, table of a past return, it says at the bottom, past 
return does not reflect future return, how many advisors still use that as if it does? How many advisors use that as if it does? Most, exactly, if not all. I agree, Brahma. So th I love this guy's blog. It's called Zero Hedge. And, and the reason, I mean, it, what he talks about here, his catchphrase is, on a long enough timeline, the survival rate of everything drops to zero. What does he mean by that, guys? On a long enough timeline, the survival rate for everything drops to zero. Nothing works forever, Charles. That's perfectly put. Nothing works forever. And I've talked about this over and over and over about the um, interest rates from the Civil War to the 1960s never went above 5%. So for 100 years, they never went above 5%. So obviously, you could be very safe in saying, telling a client, what? Interest rates will never go above 5%. And then from the 70s to the year 2000, I, I was guilty of this. From the 70s to 2000, I, I told clients, you'll never, you know, sure an annuity has 3% guarantee, but you'll never see that. We never, uh, the interest rates have never fall to 3%. You'll never see that rate of return. Well, what happened, guys? The impossible becomes possible. Nothing works forever. Everything changes. Exactly right. So there are 24,711 Yahoo Finance uh, and the fi uh, uh, funds on the Yahoo Finance screener. So here's the screener that they, that this uh, zero hedge uh, zero uh, hedge used. All funds, manager tenure of greater than five years, load fees less than two percent. So he's not going for a, a crazy. A management fee less than two percent. Funds that beat the S&P 500 uh, over five years. Oh, I missed the 500 there. Uh, guess out of 24,000 funds with those filters, how many beat it? Would you guess? 24,711 funds, and with this filter, how many beat it? Five. So you guys came, Abraham and Charles came very close. Five. So a similar criteria using Wall Street Journal mutual fund screener without the option of choosing manager tenure, but including Lipper relative performance to peers, load adjusted performance with a, with a rating of A to AAA, 71 beat it. So what percentage is that, guys? High or low? Very, very tiny. And we've all, remember we talked about the hedge funds? <laughs> they, they, I mean, they were the rage in the mid-2000s, uh, and how many of them are still around today? What happened to George Soros and all of his buddies? Gonzo. Why? It's hard. I mean, using Yahoo Finance, the average expense ratio for the growth and income fund is 1.29%. That means that over a 10-year time period, approximately 18 hundred dollars of every ten thousand will go to fees. Guys, is that a little thing? How much do you have to beat the market by to overcome that? How much do you have to beat the market by to overcome that kind of numbers? An ETF with an expense ratio of 0.12 percent would result in the cost of 154. So who's got the wind at their sales, guys? We're, all, we're talking about ten thousand dollars. What kind of a percentage of, 18, uh, of ten thousand dollars is 1883? I mean, that's crazy. That's a hard thing to overcome. I mean, look at it. Just look at these facts. Expense ratios. An index stock mutual fund is 0.2% on average. An actively managed stock fund is 1.4. So that means as expenses, as part, if, we, if we agree with what most of the academics are saying now for rates of return for stocks, which is 7% into the, near, into the uh, uh, next 10 to 20 years, an average of a 7% rate of return, what percentage is 0.2% of 7% as compared to 1.4%. Guys, is that a, that's a lot to overcome. That is a lot to overcome. And that's 1.4. When you start talking about money manager with a 1% with a to the money manager and 1% to the advisor, that's a lot to overcome. You have to overcome the market by how much, guys? A little or a lot? You have to beat the market by how much? A little or a lot? And if you beat the, if you beat the market, What's the only way to beat the market, guys? Give me some ways to beat the market. Give me some ways that you can beat the market. Luck? Yeah, I would agree with that. In fact, if you look at most of the statistical evidence, it is luck. Um, take more risk. Okay, we got one. Take more risk. Absolutely. 
Speculate and gamble, yeah. So and what, I, what I look at is taking more risk or speculate and gamble is you'll overweight in one uh, sector, right? You'll overweight in one sector. And, and when that works, that what? When you overweight in one sector, that really works. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, uh, shoot, what's his name? Peter Lynch. What sector did he overweight in? What sector did he overweight in, Peter Lynch? I mean, he was considered the, a god of investing for a whole uh, year, not technology. What sector did he overweight in? He overweight in, in retail during the, during the 90s when people were taking loans out on their houses to do what? Invest? What were they taking loans out of their houses to do? Buy more crap. <laughs> so so he, he was in the right place at the right stuff. And then when things went to heck in a handbasket, what happened to Peter Lynch? Got killed. Got killed. So if you look at um, any of the top managers, when they beat the market, it's because they're overweighted in one sector or another. Well, essentially, what happens to, to a fund that's overweighted in one sector? When, things, when they guess right, they make a lot of money. When they guess wrong, what happens? And that's really why, and I've shown you over and over and over the statistics where if you're in the top 25%, I'm sorry, if you're in the top 10% of the funds this year, you have an over 80% chance of being in the bottom 25% the following year. Because the only thing that put you in the top 10% that year was not because you were brilliant, or maybe you were brilliant, but you're only brilliant once. You were in the right sector at the right time. But if you don't get out of that right sector at the right time, guess what? you get hammered. And that's why so many, over 80% of them, end up in the bottom 25% the next year. It, and so it's very, very difficult because not only do you have to be in the right sector, but you have to be in the right sector and overcome all the expenses that you're paying. So you have to not only be right, but really right to beat the market. So here's the, here's the thing that I want you to think about. If your two biggest clients were asked these two questions, if I called up your two biggest clients, or I'm a competitor and I sat down with your two biggest clients, if you're an asset manager, if you have assets under management, and I sat down with your current biggest clients and I asked them two questions. One is, is it really 10 times more expensive to manage your $1, account, $1 million account than a $100,000 account? So what's my point there, guys? For assets under management, it's scaled versus what? How much work or how much money? It's how much money they have. So is it really fair to charge somebody 10 times more if they have a million dollars than it is 100,000? Is, is it even fair to charge somebody, uh, if they have, instead of having a $100,000 account, they have a $110,000 account? Is it even fair to charge them 10% more? Are you doing 10% more work for somebody with a $110,000 account than a $100,000 account? Are you doing... Uh, if, they, if they've got a $200,000 account instead of a $100,000 account, are you doing twice as much work for somebody with a $200,000 account as a $100,000 account? And yet, you're charging them what? Twice as much money. Would you like to be in the room with me and your client when we're having this discussion, guys? Are you going to be comfortable or are you going to start to sweat a little bit on the back of your neck? Uh, there's tiered pricing, but is there tiered pricing from 100000 to 200000 to 300000 to 400000 to 500000 Is that how the tiered pricing works, guys? What's the tiered pricing? Is it more gross than that? Because I haven't seen tiered pricing from $100,000 to $200,000. i have seen it from, uh, yeah, a half a million you get a break and, and a million you get a break, but I haven't seen it. Any more, uh, any more tiered than that, and I'll be straight with you. Does it cost you more time and effort to deal with a $100,000 than a $200,000 account? And yet it costs what? Twice as much. Does it, if you have a million dollar account versus a, a million five hundred thousand dollar account, does it cost, does it uh, uh, take more, 50% more time and effort to manage that account? Now, guys, I'm not, am I, I want to be straight here. Am I saying assets under management are evil? Is that what I'm saying? Am 
There's a big gap here. Yes, Peter says, sounds like it. No, kind of. Yeah, so no, here's what I'm saying. I recommend that my, my clients, I recommend that they have 50% of their money, the guaranteed money, in uh, uh, fixed index annuities or a, an annuity of some sort or life insurance of some sort. That's a commission-based product. I recommend 50, the other 50% in growth would be in some sort of asset under management. So I, does that sound like I'm in favor of one or the other? Because is, is commission or assets under management, is one of them better than the other? Or is it two different ways for a client to pay you? Guys, it's just two different ways for a client to pay you. Why then do you think I'm bringing this up? Why am I bringing these things up? They each have advantages and disadvantages, Daniel. Exactly, I, I totally agree. They each, each have advantages and disadvantages. To give you the whole, yeah, the reason I bring this up is to, so you have the whole picture. So you can begin to, to open up their minds and your own minds that there is no perfect answer to this. But the most important reason I'm bringing this up is so that you deal with these issues before what? You deal with these issues in your own mind before what? They ask. Exactly, Brahma. That's exactly right. I'm bringing these things up because, hey, I'm, assets under management and, and commission, we got to get paid. And I'm in favor of both of them. But you darn well better be very familiar with them before your client brings them up. Because the last thing you want is a client more familiar with how you pay fees than you. Because you're going to get slapped good and, and uh, slapped good, and it's not going to be end good. So exactly, Daniel. So you can cover these things and react before the objection. So that's the first question. Is it really 10 times more expensive to manage a $1 million account than my $100,000 account? And the second thing, is it really right to charge a management fee on top of the third-party management fee every year. So let me ask you a question, guys. When when a you go to the car dealer and he sells you, he helps you find the best car. Does he send you a bill every single year for that car for helping you find the right car? No. And yet, really, what we do when we find a money manager is we're out. Do, do, finding the best money manager for the for the client, but we're charging, and so it's a finder's fee. But then we do what every single year, really every single month? What do we do? Charge them an additional finder's fee over and over and over. And Peter's hitting it on the head. What value service do you provide in exchange for the fee you charge? That's my point. That's really the point of this whole call. Because if you don't understand that, you are going to get crushed. You want proof of that? 2013, advisor assets under management increased, but client retention decreased. It caught, so price metrics, the price management software company, uh, found that assets under management went up by 12%. Why do you think assets under management went up by 12% in 2013? Remember what the, the market was booming exactly, Peter. The market went up because, as we said, the, uh, as we said client retention decreased. So assets went up under, under management, went up because the market went up, not because people were bringing on more clients. Advisors' revenue went, uh, went up by 5%. But if the market went up by 12%, why did advisor revenue only go up by 5%, guys? If the market, <laughs> if, the, if, it, if assets under management went up by 12%, why did advisor revenue not go up by 12%? Ah, fees decreasing, Frank, you're exactly right. Average household revenue went up by 11%, but because client uh, retention decreased and because fees went down, it caused a problem. So much of that was due to the market appreciation. But here's what's happened to the average fee account. 2011, it was 1.14%. 2012 is 1.06%. 2013 was 0.99. Now, guys, what was happening to the market in 11, 12, 13? What was happening to the market? It was going up, 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 up. So if we were ever in an environment for us to be able to charge more fees, which again, we just covered earlier, would be wrong, but if we were ever in an environment where we could end up charging more fees, what kind of environment would you want to be in? Because you certainly can't charge people more fees when the market's going down. 
They're going to balk at that. You might be able to get away with it if it was going up, and yet as fee or as the market has gone up here over the last three years, fees have gone down. Why? Why have fees gone down? From the very thing I'm talking about, consumers are demanding it. Shoppers, exactly. Consumers are demanding it because the consumer media, all their media channels, are pushing, pushing, pushing the dangers and evils of fees. That's why they're going down. So you can go to the web right now and get respectable money management for 15 to 25 basis points. Same reason TVs are cheaper, exactly, Daniel. So you can go right now to the web and get respectable money management for 15 to 25 basis points. Not 2%, not 1%, but 15 to 25 basis points. These are some of the places to go. They can go to Portfolio Solutions, Wealthfront, Betterment, Personal Capital, Future Advisor, Hedgeable, Cobester. Co uh, Co These are just to name a few. And guess what? You know, just like there's new money managers every single day, guess what? There's new uh, uh, deep discount money management. And these are actually respectable money managers. They have as good a story as, I, as any 2% uh, uh, or 1% money manager out there. So more and more, you're, this is the pressure for assets under management. This is, more, this is the pressure for commission. This is the pressure for our jobs is online. So when they can go out there and get money management for 25 bips, that is, is uh, 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 not going to be able to help you turn on the lights and have the kind of lifestyle that you have right now. So am I saying, oh my gosh, uh, find another job, you know, you know, start, you know, go back to school? No, am I? No, don't hide from this. It's what I was saying earlier. There is no bad way to get paid, whether it's commission or assets under management. They both have advantages. They both have disadvantages. But as some of you've been hinting at, it's it's not. We have to understand why we're charging commissions or why why we're charging fees, and we better discuss it with the client when. Before they ask or after they ask? Because unfortunately, you know what? You're lucky if they ask. What are they more likely to do? If I'm a restaurant manager, if I'm a restaurant manager, do I want my, my customers to complain? Do I want my customers to complain if I'm a restaurant manager? Yeah, I do, because at least then I can take care of it. Because if they walk out of that restaurant dissatisfied, they're never going to come back. But just human nature, how many people like to complain? Is that the majority of the minority that like to complain? Is the majority of people or minority? Again, we, we talked about this when you first came onto the, the event. Bill says the majority like to, to complain. Really? Do the majority of people like to complain, guys? Are most people, you're, most of you, get, you're getting it right. No, but it's a minority. Because here's the thing. Are people uh, confrontational by nature? Are most people confrontational by nature? No, it's, it's, the, it's the few that make life miserable for all of us, but most people are not confrontational. So how do they deal with conflict? They leave. So you need to address this before it happens, not after it happens, because you may not know why they left you. So you've got to change the relationship. You've got to be the expert, and you've got to be positive on why you're the expert. So when it comes to fees, don't say you charge 1% in fees. Say you charge 0.25% in fees. The other 0.75% is for your advice, for your service, for everything we do on the 21. Guys, this is the whole reason that I created the 21. Many of you have heard the epiphany that I had. I mean, uh, the, the, um, the epiphany that I had was, was I was sitting in the dining room, and, my, my, and I was just swearing and throwing papers and throwing the pencil down and and Michelle said, well, what's your problem? And I said, for the last five years, I have probably pumped $30,000 into different money management systems. I've looked at their past performance. I've looked at their back testing. And I, and I do a ton of research. And then based on that research, I'll go ahead and invest with them. And as soon as I invest with them, what happens to all that, guys? As soon as I would, a, a money management system that worked fabulously, back testing, um, um, uh, historical returns. It, it, as soon as it seemed like, as soon as I invested my money, it went south. So I said, "Okay, that's not going to work." I go find another one. I think I went through like seven different money managers, and that happened every single one. So I said, "You know what? I, I'd be far better off just investing in the index." 
And guess what she said to me? I said, there is proof upon proof upon proof of academic proof that I'd be far better off just to invest in the index. So what'd she say? Do it. And then that's when my world came crashing down upon me. Why? Because I had to make a choice at that point. Because if I invested in that, how much does it really cost to invest in the index? Nothing. How much management does that take, guys, to be invested in the index? Nothing. So I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision that I was going to do what's right for me, but I'd go ahead and keep t throwing my clients at, at stupid things like money management and, and fund managers, etc., where they charge fees. So then I would have to live with myself that I was doing the right thing, paying no fees, and they were paying fees to be in crappy funds. So I could do that, but I, that didn't sit right with me. Or I could invest myself in the same money managers and the same mutual funds and, and, and continue to perform, underperform the market just like my clients, because then at least, you know, at least I don't feel guilty. I, I'm in as bad a situation as they are because I'm paying way too much for way too little. Or I could invest in the S&P 500 and suggest that they invest in the S&P 500, which means that what? I am now what? Out of business. I mean, I can't charge them to be in the S&P 500. How long are they going to put up with that? And the 21 was my solution to that. Because now they are getting good rates of return. And yes, they're paying for it. And they may be able to get better rates of return just with the S&P 500, just by being in the index, but what would they not have? What would they not have? Peace of mind? I'd agree with that, Bruce. And peace of mind, I'm going to take it right back to the 21-point checklist. Peace of mind about what? Just their investments or about everything? Their future, exactly, Bruce. That everything is done right. Why do you think when I have my annual reviews, the first thing I whip out is not their statements. The first thing I whip out is the 21-point checklist. Why? To constantly remind them that I am not their money manager. I am their financial advisor. Because if you're their money manager, you're going to live by that return and you're going to what? So on the years that that return is good, fabulous meetings. On the year that is bad, horrible meetings. So you, you, you put me in front of somebody who has a money manager that isn't doing all 21 things, they're gone. They will leave their money manager in an hour and a half. They will leave anything they're doing in an hour and a half. Because you know what? I don't care if people are char our competitors are charging commissions or charging fees. Either one of them, they're overcharging. Why? See, that's my point. Commission's not bad. Asset Center or AUM is not bad. They're both bad. They're both bad unless you what? If all you're doing is charging them a commission to sell them a product, if all you're doing is charging them assets under management fees to sell them a product, and guys, is a money, manage, money management a product? Is money management a product? Yes. So if all I'm doing is charging them a fee to sell a product or charge them a commission to sell a product, then I'm what? Overcharging. Either way, because if I'm not doing all these other 21 things that we do for the client, then I'm overcharging. You get why when you get in front of somebody with a 21-point checklist and you do it right, guess what? If you go through those non-financial things as a, oh, this is a good idea, oh, this is a good idea, oh, this is a good idea, what do people do with good ideas, guys? What do most people do with good ideas? Huh, I wish, Dan. Dan says take them. Really, do people take them? Guys, if people took good ideas, how wealthy would we be? You've spent your whole entire career giving people good ideas, and how many people take them? Yeah, they, you're right, Dan. They take them away from you. <laughs> That's what they do. But most people, will they lift a finger? Will they lift their left pinky for a good idea? I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like the, we talk about the movie theater analogy, where if I'm in, the, if I'm in a movie theater and, 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 and the movie's okay, not great, not horrible, it's okay, it's good, not great, not good, and, and somebody comes and says, oh, I've got a lot better movie over to the next theater. What, what will most people do? 
Nothing. So I need to show them that there's more to it than just the money. And if you think of the non-financial, remember here a couple weeks ago, which is now on the website, guys, if you go preparing for the disclosure meeting on the website, preparing for the disclosure meeting, you'll see that coaching call there where I go through all 21 items and how their life would be screwed up completely if they did not do any of them. So we, we walk through why their life would be screwed up and the consequences of not having a survivor's guide, why their life would be screwed up and the consequences of their will isn't done right, why their life would be screwed up and the consequences of their power of attorney is not done right, how their life, if any one of these 21 things happens, to them, their life could be unraveled. So what we do is make sure that we are, somebody, that's how three or four people mentioned earlier, we are holistic planners. We take care of their beings. We take care of their families. We don't take care of the money. That's just part of their being and part of their families. It's part of what we do. It's not what we do. Because if you live by the, that money management, You've seen what's happening to people with the fee, with advisors with the fees are going down, down, down. Clients are leaving them. They're going to the online um, uh, cheap discount brokers. Not brokers, cheap dis brokers we can live with. Cheap discount money managers, that's becoming tougher and tougher for us to deal with. They're going to the cheap uh, discount money managers. And these money managers are top notch managers charging 0.15 to 0.25%. So if you are not providing true value, to them, what's going to happen every single year? Is it going to get easier to make money or harder to make money? But how many of those online advisors uh, or online money managers do these 21 things? In fact, how many of our live competition do these 21 things? None. So I wanted you to take from this call that there is no great way to charge a client, whether it's a commission or whether it's assets under management, they're both lousy. I'm sorry, they're both lousy, but we gotta get paid to do what we do. So if we wanna do what we do, we better be doing the 21 point checklist. We better make sure the client understands how important those things are. Because if the client doesn't understand how important those 21 things are, and they see this uh, money manager online for 0.15 or 0.25 or some competitor Give you gives slings them some line of BS about how great their money manager is. What will happen to you? You'll be gone. But if they understand the importance of these twenty one things and why you bring it up every single time that you talk to them at their reviews, the first things you talk about is the survivor's guide. Did they get it done? The first thing you talk about is the power of attorney. Has anything changed? The first thing you talk about is those things. Guess what? They're not going to be tempted to do leave you. And more importantly, guess what the people you run across are going to be tempted to do when you make sure they understand the importance of the non-financial. The consequences of any one of those 21 things being not done. Not just one of them. Not all 21. Any one of them could unravel 40 years of work. So do you get that? We char have to charge to do what we do. There's no better way to do this. There's, I mean, there's no better way to, to, to charge fees, whether it's assets under management or uh, commission. They're both viable. That's why I recommend both of them. But it's going to become tougher and tougher for guys that are just doing commission or just doing assets under management unless they're providing a lot more value than just uh, uh, having an annual meeting with a client to discuss what they could have found out from the money manager themselves or from a statement from their uh, the commission product. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, get her done with the 21, exactly, Frank. So was this helpful to you guys? Do you understand I'm not slamming assets under management, I'm not slamming commission. They're both uh, uh, not very good as far as consumers are concerned unless you, they're getting something for it. The 21 allows you to give them something for it. Okay? Let's see. Oh, add, uh, yeah, Casey brings up some great points. Add monthly newsletters, client appreciation events, birthdays, locking in the clients. Exactly right, Casey. That's exactly right. Super. So that's all I have. So uh, I'll give you a 15-minute break here. So have a great rest of the week, and we'll talk to you all on Friday. Thanks, guys.